Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the ISU USA Euromed program. This is the second day. Yesterday we had two modules, and today we are discussing about two modules. One of them is about RIRS module by moderated by Dr. Kanda Parikh, and the laparoscopy and robotic module by Dr. Ramlingam. Uh, I welcome all of you for this uh, today's session, and over to Dr. Rajiv Sood for his opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Keshav. Uh, this is a great times going on uh, when bad times are otherwise uh, because of COVID pandemic. Our academic is not halted and uh, Euromat programs, which are physical programs otherwise, we have endeavored to convert it into also uh, virtual program. And uh, these are the new technologies, new new concepts which are getting imbibed in the education system. Uh, you know that uh, government of India has already uh, notified that uh, competency-based uh, education to be part of MBBS for uh, internship. It is ready with ICMR competency-based training, and now for post-graduation and also post-doctoral, it is being imparted and it is going to be integrated and made compulsory. Like you must be knowing, R&D has been made compulsory for promotions for faculty positions. And now the courses are going on and uh, they are made mandatory if somebody has to survive in the system. And these are not only for the promotions or for, for the better education system, but it is uh, essential. And uh, I'm happy to share with you that uh, USI has taken this concept already four or five years back. And uh, it is the part of the vision document, which was released in 2017. Now we are in the fifth year. Now uh, coming to Euromat back, it is uh, virtual and we are having normally in the physical Euromats, the simulation programs. And after that, we are having uh, cadaveric wet labs and uh, also we are arranging uh, uh, distant education. But this Euromat is very important because yesterday two modules, this is just the beginning. We will be looking for the feedback from the participants as well as the trainers. And uh, on the basis of these feedbacks, uh, we will be integrating. This is the first program, but uh, in future, what we will be doing, we will be giving pre-test and uh, to the audience and then post-test that how they are added to the uh, met and unmet uh, uh, um, uh, demands, uh, the, uh, uh, goals which were there and uh, after debriefing and after uh, conclusions uh, drawing, we will be improving our Euromat virtual programs. Euromat is not only on the mechanical, yesterday we have already discussed, it can be simple uh, simulation, it can be uh, uh, mechanical uh, simulation, it can be standardized uh, simulation or it can be virtual simulation. So today we are doing the virtual simulation. This is the fourth type of simulation and the third type of mechanical simulations we are doing in Olympus facility and other places. So this all is going on. We will be better understanding it and we our residents will be understanding it better and we will be prepared for the competency based education and training. So this is uh, this was the goal of uh, Indian School of urology and I'm grateful to all the faculty who has prepared it uh, systematically and uh, we will be sending the template that how they have to now uh, write their conclusions and get the feedback from the students also and all the residents. Uh, uh, it is now their turn to be attentive. Faculty has done their role. They have prepared a very good program, very effective way of teaching. Uh, this is what is emerging in this uh, uh, new times. And uh, congratulations to all and best of luck for today's program. Back to Dr. Keshav. Thank you, Professor Sood. Now I invite uh, Dr. Kanda Parikh, who is going to moderate the first session, to take over and moderate that session. Over to you, Kanda. Thank you, uh, Keshav, and thank you, ISU, for this lovely opportunity to uh, communicate with the colleagues and um, PGs. And this being the first ISU virtual program, uh, I wish them good luck, and I hope that all the faculty will do a fantastic job. Uh, I have participated in many uh, physical programs, ISU programs, 
but this first time we are participating in the virtual program so uh, and to participate with me i have got three uh, very important people experts in the field of rirs so without wasting much time i think we'll straight away go to our rirs module program uh, with me we have dr tanuj paul bhatia who is a consultant urologist at uh, sarvodaya hospital and uh, Dr. K M Nanjappa from Thane, uh, Mumbai. He is also a consultant urologist, and uh, with us we also have Dr. Abhishek Singh from MPUH uh, Nadiyat, who is a consultant urologist working at MPUH. So, without wasting much time, let's go straight to our RIRS module learning. And the first talk is by Dr. Tanuj Paul Bhatia, who is going to talk about the module learning in RIRS. Dr. Tanuj, over to you. Thank you, Kandab, sir. Thank you, USA and Euromed program for this opportunity. It's always a pleasure to be a part of the Euromed program. Um, can you see my screen, sir? Yes, sir. I'm just... So, uh, good morning, everyone. I will be talking about module-based learning in RIRS today. So, I'll start by discussing what is the need for simulation. Why really do we need simulation? So, the earlier uh, surgical teaching was based on the Hestadian model of C1, do one, teach one, but this is now considered obsolete. This is mainly because now there are limited working hours of trainees. In India, we have more number of trainees than we used to have before in a, at a particular center. There is lesser time spent in the, by the trainees in the operation theater. There is reduced continuity of trainee-trainer relationship, and there are patient safety concerns, and with time, where there are growing patient expectations and litigations. So because of all this, there is decreased amount of time and opportunity for the novice trainees received in operation theater. So that is why we need simulation. So Bruce Lee said that I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. So this basically outlines the importance of simulation that one can actually practice a step or a procedure on a simulator multiple number of times without harming or without uh, you know having to practice on actual patients and improve his technique and thereby improve the outcome of the surgery. So the simulation is, simulation is basically defined as a technique to replace or amplify real experiences with guided experiences that evoke or replicate substantial aspects of the real world in a fully interactive manner. And a simulator is a device or a model used for training of an individual while Im imitating real life scenarios. To achieve optimal educational outcomes, it is now uh, it is now believed the simulation must be integrated into the curriculum of all residents, and it must encompass education principles such as feedback, deliberate practice, masterly learning, outcome measurement, and skill acquisition and maintenance. So, coming to some of the definitions of terms related to assessment of simulators, because you are going to there are a lot of talks on simulation today. I think it is important to understand these terms. So first thing is the face validity. Face validity means the extent to which the examination resembles the situation in real world. That means the way it resembles the real procedure. Second is the content validity, which means extent to which the intended content domain is being measured by assessment exercise. Construct validity means extent to which the test is able to differentiate between a good and a bad performer or two groups of, of performers, say a very experienced surgeon and a resident. Concurrent validity means the extent to which the test correlates with the gold standard test. Say there is one simulator which is accepted as a gold standard and there is a newer one being developed. If it compares with the real gold standard, then it is considered as concurrent validity. Predictive validity means the extent to which assessment will predict future performance of the resident. And educational impact means the way it can contribute to improving the learning strategy. strategy. We know about cost effectiveness and feasibility. So coming to history of surgical simulation, the first example of simulation actually came from India itself uh, in six, around 600 BC when uh, first recorded instances of surgical simulation were used uh, using the leaf and clay models to conceptualize nasal reconstruction with a forehead flap. Other examples of early simulator use have been of use of wooden benchtop models, live animals and human cadavers. Ambrose Pere was known, uh, he is one of the fathers of surgery. He was known to take embalmed cadavers home to practice new surgical techniques. 
In 1980s, the mannequins came in mainly by the anesthetists. They used microprocessor chips and computer software to create artificial vital signs, which responded to interventions, emergencies, and other factors. In 1990s, we got the virtual reality simulators, which were considered to be ethical, safe, and repeatable. And then came in the hybrid simulators, which combined the actual surgical tools with realistic operating tool with computerized images. So if we have to classify simulators, they can be classified as low fidelity and high fidelity. These terms are important to understand because you will see a lot of these terms in the future, further slides and even in the other talks in the program today. So low fidelity means when a simulator replicates a single step and high fidelity means if it can replicate the complete procedure, then it can also be classified as biological versus non-biological simulator depending on the make it. Then it depends on the type of simulation also as reality or virtual Simulator, the reality simulators are synthetic bench models, cadaver or human uh, animal models, and full immersion models, and virtual ones are augmented reality and computer-assisted simulators. Now, coming to benchtop simulators, these are synthetic standalone simulators like the ones we use for practicing knot tying and peg transfer in laparoscopy, or the ones we use in our Euromet and USI program for HOLEP simulation. It allows for practice and assessment of skills. It allows for development of hand-eye coordination and dexterity. The drawback is that high fidelity models are not easily available and synthetic materials, they lack realism. Then uh, there are the animal models, uh, like the live animal models, the advantages are high fidelity. The surgeon practices not just steps, but also the avoidance of complications. The entire team can practice, so one can enhance not just the technical skills, but also the non-technical skills. And also some organs can be taken ex vivo and can be used as benchtop models. The drawbacks of these are that structural differences exist between human and animal anatomy. There are ethical issues like it, they are banned in UK and they are expensive. Then there are cadaveric models. Fresh cadaveric tissue is the gold standard for surgical simulation because it can correctly simulate the anatomical structures. Pressurized systems can be used to perfuse the tissues. They have high fidelity and they are especially important for trauma and vascular surgery. Embalmed cadavers have poor compliance and limited availability and you need special facilities to maintain them. Thiel embalmed cadavers are coming up as uh, simulators. Uh, the advantage they offer, they have good tissue color, they have good consistency and malleability. They have been used for uh, TUR and URS with uh, good results. Then we have the virtual reality simulators. They, are, they have high fidelity. They also allow hand-eye coordination, fine motor skills, and familiarity with the procedure. Another advantage that VR offers us is, is the metrics. That is, we, they can assess the time to complete the task, the errors made, and the surgeon's economy of movement. And one may not always need supervision uh, when one is uh, learning on VR simulator. The drawbacks are the high cost, the lack of force feedback, and the lack of realism. Then we have the fully immersion simulation, which actually is a completely set up OR where a trainee can, be, uh, uh, can learn. Most commonly used ones are the one like this, which are called igloos. So coming to RARS simulators, I will first discuss the commonly used ones. So we'll start with the bench top models. So Euroscopic Trainer by Limb and Things is one of the popular bench top RARS simulator. It has a high physical, uh, uh, I mean, it has a high fidelity physical model. It, was, it has been evaluated by three studies uh, and they found that post practice and post didactic scores improved significantly. The senior resident scored better than the junior residents and the realism average was 6.74 of 10. So basically this simulator had uh, face validity, content validity and construct validity. Then there was scope trainer from Mediscals Limited uh, from UK. This also has high fidelity. It also has a urethra, bladder, uh, ureters, and kidney model. Uh, the advantage this offers is a distensible bladder and a transparent dome, so the mentor can monitor. Uh, it has been assessed by two studies, both by Brahmer and his associates. They found that urologists subspecialized in endourology scored better. All trainees claimed it was similar to real surgeries. All trainees scored better after training and the experienced surgeon scored better. So these are the parameters which tell us about the validity of a, a simulator. So again, this has face validity, content validity, and construct validity. Then there is the adult urethroscopy trainer from Ideal Anatomic Modeling. This also is a high fidelity model. Uh, it was assessed by White et al. on a study on 46 participants. 100% of the participants rated the model realistic and easy to use. 98% believed it was good training format. Experts outperformed the less trained surgeons. So this also had face validity, content validity, and construct validity. Then there is the endo-euro trainer from SEMED uh, GmbH. And this is uh, 
something that we use commonly in our uh, USA, ISA, ISU, Euromed programs. The advantage is that trainees can practice in and out movement of the scope, pronation and supination, and deflection of the scope. Also, one can practice grasping and releasing. So apart from a simple URS, uh, the trainee can practice stone extraction and basketing as well in terms of a mentor. And stone can be fragmented also if the laser or a, uh, is available. So these are two small videos showing the use of uh, this particular simulator. So here this person is holding the scope. This is not the right way, but this is not uh, non-medico actually holding the scope. So we can see that he's, uh, there is an access sheet has been placed through the urethra into the kidney and there he's passing the scope. And as he's going in, you can see in the right side image, you can, the scope is passing through the access sheet. So it is quite like real. So when you go in uh, further in, and then you enter the uh, ureter, and then you enter the pelvic glacial system. Now inside this uh, uh, kidney also, they have uh, made proper calluses and uh, they have, it is possible to put stones in there. So one can actually practice going into different calluses. That is the most important aspect of RIRS. One needs to practice how to use the scope, how to hold it, how to move it into different calluses. And uh, once one has uh, mastered that, then one can uh, try to you know, catch a stone and transfer it to another calyx or even to break the stone if one wants to. It is also possible to have continuous irrigation in this particular model. Then there is a Cook URS model, which is used in uh, Cook workshops mainly. It has been validated in a study uh, of URS course for 15 uh, trainees. They performed significantly better in skills and uh, time and simulator demonstrated phase content and construct validity. It's pretty much similar to the other simulators. Then we have our own Indian Tejnaksh all-in-one simulator from our star innovator faculty, Dr. Ashish Patel, with the advantages that uh, it is a reusable, portable uh, simulator. It can be used under fluoroscopy and uh, the endoscopic view replicates the natural tissue appearance. The mentor can monitor from uh, outside because it is a transparent uh, simulator and also one can adjust the difficulty level for URS and RIRS. Now, from benchtop models coming to animal and cadaveric models uh, for URS particularly, these have been few, but uh, URS has been uh, practiced on thiel embam cadavers uh, and live porcine and uh, XYO porcine urinary tract models, and it has been found to have phase content and construct validity. Kanuj, now, we have time Kanuj. Sir, I'll quickly finish. So coming to a virtual reality simulator, most popular is the Euromentor from Symbionix. It is high fidelity, it is Windows based, incorporates a mannequin and computer interface. One can have different programs for a patient as well as different endoscopes. Objective assessment is possible and it has good validity in all forms and predictive validity and educational impact. This is a video how one can practice in the Symbionix virtual reality simulator. One can select the laser. You can see the stone there, a guideware was placed initially then the uh, trainee is fragmenting the stone. Then after fragmenting, he can actually select one of the baskets and even extract the stone. So, so that is the advantage of this virtual reality. He's just holding the stone and extracting and you can also have the fluoro guided image. Coming, I'll just show it to a small slides about future direction, what is changing. One thing that is coming in in big way is the 3D printing. We can make 3D printing models of different types of anatomy and they can be incorporated into to the already present benchtop uh, models and they can be used nicely. Even the stones can be made by make, mixing water and chalk in variable proportions. It has high fidelity, but not yet valid, uh, validated. Then we have the head mounted displays coming in, which can really help in the uh, uh, simulation as well as uh, maybe in the real OR we might have these head mounted uh, displays in future. And then we have the VIPAR which is a visual interactive presence and augmented reality where the trainee is sitting in his operation theater and the mentor is in, his, in a distant place in his own office and he can actually uh, train him uh, real time. Thank you, sir. I will stop. So th uh, yeah. Thank you, Tanush, uh, for a nice talk. Now, just before we go to the next talk, just one question from the audience. Uh, yes, sir. Do you have any idea about the cost of this kind of uh, trainers so that one can buy in private practice? Do you have any idea? Or it is an institutional based? Uh, sir, yes, sir. The, so the, the uh, most costly ones are the virtual uh, ones. 
which have an innovative cost. The other benchtop models are not very costly. Institutions can definitely afford it. A uh, single setup may have difficulty because you know then you have to think about the cost effectiveness and all things. Even now, uh, the trainees are not ready to pay that kind of amount in India generally. All right. Okay. So now I think let's move uh, on the another topic that is by Dr. K. M. Nanjappa. Uh, Dr. Nanjappa is going to talk about how to access the pelvic alisal system. Nanjappa, you can share your screen, please. Thank you, Kandar. Uh, and thank you, USA and ISU for this opportunity. I have been asked today morning to discuss with all of you all how to access the pelvic collateral system in RIRS. I have no disclosures. Now, first question, what I want to discuss is why this access is so important? Because, you know, RIRS is one topic where you are not sure whether actually you can go into the pelvic collateral system in the first step and you have to stage the procedure. Secondly, the equipment which is used here is so delicate and expensive that if you don't have a proper plan, not only have you to stage your procedure, but you can even lose your equipment. So to discuss the types of access, we all know that it can be with a sheet, that is an access sheet. If you're not using a sheet, you can go over a wire or you can directly go without a sheet and without a wire. So how to plan your access? Now, if this is just when to choose what, but this is just a broad guideline where it is clearly interchangeable. Like if you are starting your process procedure and if you're starting to learn the process, you are definitely going to handle pre-stented patients. And in that, all the cases, you are going to use an access sheet. Not only that, the sheath way of accessing is the most favorite among all the most of the RIRS surgeons. And definitely it is used when you want to fragment and extract stones and you are doing with a large stone burden. If a sheath doesn't go in, definitely once you are experienced enough, you will backload your scope over a wire or you're dealing with a very small burden stone. I'm definitely just going to dust the stone. Once you go on experience and you're going to go for diagnostic procedures, you don't want even a wire to cause any artifacts inside and you may then go directly without a sheath and without a wire. So the first important thing about access is dilatation. Now we are discussing, still we discuss dilatation here, dilating the ureteric orifice, because just like in semi-rigid ureteroscopy, we used to discuss in the past when we had those, you know, the large diameter equipment, the same thing is there with flexible now. Few of the surgeons still do active dilatation with the help of a serial dilator or balloon dilator, but most of them, they use optical dilatation. Now what is optical dilatation is just dilating or a passive dilatation of your ureteric or orifice. It's also called as calibration. There you put your semi-rigid URS right up to the PCS into the pelvis. And last, if nothing happens, you have to stage it with the help of a DJ stent. Now let us discuss how we do the first type of uh, access that is with an access sheet. The most important question comes here, which access sheet should I open? I'll not discuss into the details of an access sheet, but we all know the length would depend on the age, build and height of the patient. Now, a very important tip over here, when we do optical calibration is, you can actually decide the size of your access sheet which you want to open. Everybody in India would be definitely having a semi-rigid 6, 7.5, which is the commonest of the uh, you know, semi-rigid scopes which you use. If you can pass a semi-rigid scope right up to the upper ureter or into the pelvis, you definitely, that ureter will accommodate a 9.5, 11.5 or 10, 12 axis sheet. Now, if you feel it is more capacious and very rarely in Indian ureter, if you want to primarily try a 8, 9.8 .8 or a pre-stented patient, if it goes into the upper ureter in the pelvis, then 11, 13 or a 12, 14 access sheet would definitely go. So you can easily open up this. If both these scopes are not going in, and if you try a 4.5, 6.5, in that case, even if it goes up to the upper ureter in the pelvis, a access sheet would not go, but you will have to backload your scope over it over a wire. Now the question comes, are you going to push open the smallest ureteral axis sheet through which your scope goes? 
no a point very important here there is a small general rule that always use a uh, axis sheet two french more than the maximum diameter of your scope or there is a small study which has given us a small formula here that is called as ratio of your endoscopic sheath diameter you take the outer diameter of your scope to the inner diameter of your axis sheet if it is less than 0.75 um the match is best it's beautiful your intrarenal pressures would be really low if it is between 0.75 and 0.85 here you have to be guarded because when your channel is free the pressure should rise but if this ratio is above 0.85 that match is not done and you are not supposed to use that axis sheet now we'll just go brush through the steps of passing an axis sheet now this is very very important once you have calibrated and passed a wire over there the first important step is to lubricate your axis sheet you have to lubricate your axis sheet with normal saline and not with jelly and see that you lock the hub the most important thing here is to lock your hub and then you will uh backload it over your pre-placed wire slowly into the pelvic calcium system without forcing under fluoroscopy guidance as it is done over here you can see that it is slowly backloaded and it is pushed right as we everybody passes a ureteral dilator that's the amount of force you're supposed to use and over fluoroscopy here you can guide it right up to the pcs and see that the axis sheet is placed just below the puj a small tip here once you have an axis sheet in place and you put a scope there just follow this drops of water which come out this gives you a feeling that your scope and your sheet is matching well and everything is going very well just a theoretical slide to tell you what are the advantages of using your axis sheet and uh, you know disadvantages let us go into this very important point that you have calibrated your ureter but that axis sheet doesn't go in now what could be the reason the first thing is see that you are using a new axis sheet in that case pull out a new axis sheet because most of us reuse axis sheets now here you have to take a new axis sheet because here the hydrophilic coating on your axis sheet is gone the second important point see whether your hub is locked properly because if your hub is not locked there is a play between your obturator and your sheet and that could prevent it from going in third important thing is if you have a high bladder neck you just shift over from your normal wire to a stiffer wire now this also is a very important point which can happen in when you're using a sheet your procedure is over you try to pull your sheet out your sheet gets stuck what to do don't panic just put the obturator back and place a wire through it into the pcs and give a slow gentle continuous traction on the sheet a point which i had made in the past that don't try to lubricate your axis sheet with jelly because once the jelly dries up sometimes your sheet can get stuck if it doesn't come out like this just give gentle rotational movement anti clockwise and clockwise rotational movement on your sheet and that is definitely it would come down come about the second part which we go to is accessing by backloading in backloading the only difference here is try and use a by wire a by wire is flexible on both sides so here you are going to backload your scope to on the by wire pre placed by wire and with the help of fluoroscopy guide it into the pcs so that it doesn't damage your scope what will happen here sometimes your scope can get stuck at the ureteric orifice this normally you will come to what to do in this situation simple just rotate your scope by 180 degrees you are using fluoro and try to keep your bladder empty in that you not only get your ureteric orifice near to the bladder neck but also at the same time you will see that there is a very short length of the intramural ureter and it is very relaxed and this will help to get through our this problem last once you get experience you can literally go sheathless and wireless and this is for diagnostic purposes where you can use a scope which has a tapered tip traxer and grasso have given us beautiful three movements first they said once you are in the bladder you should rotate then you should deflect and last you should push so let us see once you are in the bladder you have to rotate to the side of your orifice then you deflect and then you push yourself into that ureteric orifice so this is the thing where you don't use even a wire to get into the ureteric orifice no sheath and this with practice and with experience you can easily master even this way of getting into the um 
into the ureter. Now here, in both these techniques which we have done, there can be some problem. Now let us see what is the most important thing which we have to. When you're using a fiber optic scope, here there can be actually buckling of your scope at the ureteric orifice. Remember, this is one thing which we all have to remember because this can damage your fiber optic scope really badly. Now, which scope should you use when you don't have an access sheet? This is again a tip. Remember that when we're using a flexible scope and if you have to go into the ureteric orifice without an access sheet, always try to don't use a flat end scope. Use a scope which has got a taper tip and a scope which has got a good column strength. Just a passing by remark on the safety guide wire because all the accesses we are going to discuss whether to use a safety guide wire or not to use a safety guide wire. Definitely in Indian ureters, it is going to be difficult, but when you're going to start your RIRS program, all your patients are going to be pre-stented. So in these patients, you have to use a safety guide wire. As you go ahead and as you become experienced, you may not use a safety guide wire, but definitely your scope and your access sheet will act a safety guide wire. There are certain indications where a guide wire is very, very important. That would be when you have an impacted upper ureteric stone, you had a ureteral kink, you have a difficult anatomy, or you have a very large stone burden. So these are the indications, but most of us don't use a safety guide wire because in Indian ureters, it's very, very difficult. Now, access in a pediatric patients. Yeah, definitely in very, very young kids, we don't use access sheet because it's not the problem with the ureter, it's the problem with the urethra. So you try and do a pediatric case by backloading or without an access sheath if possible. In certain conditions with abnormal horseshoe kidney and ectopic kidney, where your ureters are, there's a high insertion of a ureter, be very careful when you're using an access sheath and use a shorter length access sheath in these patients. I mean, in patients where you have to do an RIRS in a transplanted kidney or when there is urinary diversion. Now, these cases, you may fail an access retrograde, but in these cases, you can have an access anti-grade. So what does the future hold for access? Mind you, this topic would be irrelevant in a year or two when you have these new scopes coming in because we will have best of both the worlds. You will have the, all the features of your semi-rigid scope in your flexible scope. So you can definitely, this is the new prototype bought by Wolf where they have a semi-rigid tip. I mean, you have a full shaft which is almost uh, rigid and the tip which is flexible. So as your scopes become digital, limited, disposable, we will never talk of how to access as we don't talk with semi-rigid ureteroscopy. And this topic would be defunct in the next one or two years. So my dear friends, the most important thing what we should know is in RIRS to access, know your equipment well, have a plan fixed, be flexible to change your access, always be safe and definitely you can come in another day, have an exit strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nanjappa, for excellent and very nice, crisp talk covering all the practical aspect of access to pelvic elisal system. And uh, now I'll, I'll be sharing my screen. Uh, are you in a position to see my screen? No, not yet, Kadar. Okay, let's go down. And uh, Nanjappa, one more question. Uh, how many patients in your yeah, we can practice, have <laughs> how many patients in your practice do you put a safety guide wire? How many patients? I only use it for upper ureteric stones, impacted upper ureteric stones. The stone is very badly impacted. And I really, uh, you know, I'm scared that I would be perforating the ureter and lose an access here. In these cases, I try and first tie and keep a safety guide wire. And later on, uh, you know, once I'm comfortable and the stone is in the pelvis, if my safety guide wire is not coming in my way, I still maintain it. Otherwise, I, that's the only indication for me today to keep a safety guide wire. Uh, very rarely I use a safety guide wire. That's correct. And because if you look at the EAU and as well as the AUA guideline, most of the guidelines say that you have to put a safety guide wire. But practically in India, all of us have the same experience what you are 
sharing. So because this is a program for the PGs, I think when you speak in exams, maybe you can speak that uh, we will put a safety guide wire, but uh, that's a theoretical thing, uh, as well as you can say that practically we have found it very difficult. Now I'm going to talk about uh, dust or fragment. The goal of renal stone surgery is a stone free status. Whether you want to dust or whether you want to fragment, at the end of the day, the patient should be happy without any morbidity or complication. Most of the times, the decision of whether to dust or to fragment is taken preoperatively when you are evaluating CT scan. Look at the size of the stone. As in this case, if the stone is less than one centimeter, my strategy almost always will be to fragment the stone and do a complete clearance. If the stone is between 10 to 20 mm, in that case, I do initial dusting and the fragmentation later on and do a complete clearance. When the stone is more than two centimeters, as it is shown in this X-ray, I will initially dust, fragment, and sometimes I'll have to use a popcorning or a pop dusting technique. Also, the location of the stone is also very critical. The stone in a lower pole, especially the large stone, is a big challenge. My colleague, Dr. Abhishek, is going to cover on this, so I will not uh, talk much about it. Also, look at the number of the stones. How many stones the person has in a kidney? And the third important thing is that always look for the Hunsfield value of the stone. That will give you idea whether you want to dust or bust the stone. Now, here in this case, when there are multiple stones as it is shown in this x-ray. All the stones are very small in different calyx. In that case, I will begin to fragment this stone in one calyx and then take out, clear one calyx, go to the another calyx and then fragment and take out or grab the stone with the basket. When there are multiple stones like this, always begin with the lower calyx and then go up. When there are two stones, one stone is the large stone and other stone is a small stone, always deal with the smaller stone first. Because the moment you try to dust the larger stone, big stone, in that case, there will be a lot of dust and that probably you will lose that small stone. So it is a good idea that deal with the small stone first, do a clearance and then go to the large stone. Now, when you do a ureteroscopy, you can find that you can judge that what kind of stone it is. And you also know the Hunsfield value of the stone. If it is a calcium oxalate monohydrate stone, in that case, it is very, very easy to do a very nice golden dusting in the beginning of the surgery. But as you go to the, towards the center of the stone, it is very difficult to produce a good dust. In that case, you will have to fragment the stone into the small pieces and then take out with the basket. When it is a calcium oxalate dihydrate stone, like shown in this video, it is easy to produce a fine dust. And if it is a metric stone, it is like shown here in this video, it is extremely difficult to dust this kind of a stone. The HU is very, very low in these patients, but it is extremely difficult to dust this stone. Even fragmenting the stone with the laser is also very, very difficult. So we'll have to fragment the stone in few pieces and then try to um, grab the fragments and do a complete clearance because if you leave behind many small stone fragments in a matrix stone, especially there will be a post-operatively infection. Now, let us look at the laser physiology a little bit. Once the laser energy is emitted from the tip of the laser fiber, there is a heating of the irrigation fluid that will generate a vapor bubble this vapor bubble expands and then collapses and then produces the acoustic shock waves, which can produce a fragmentation or stone dusting of the stone. So large amount of the holmium laser energy is diverted towards producing a, this vapor bubble. Some amount of the laser energy passes through this vapor bubble before it bursts to the stone and cause the heating of the stone which may result in the fragmentation and the dusting, which is also known as a photothermal or the photochemical effect. The problem with this kind of laser is that there will be a retropulsion. That is because 
the stone in because of the photoacoustic effect and because the less energy is diverted towards the stone there it the procedure becomes less effective and time consuming so in order to circumvent this problem the recently the pulse modulation techniques or the technology has come into the play luminous has invented oh, sorry to interrupt kanda yeah i can't see your slides moving is it only me or is it uh... you can't see the slide moving your slides are frozen slides are not moving sir yes even at my slides are not moving yeah can you the see slides? the slides are not moving so i think no, your no no, no yeah. your slides are frozen so your talk oh. has gone ahead but your slides are frozen oh god anyway now can you see the slide now we can see no, your sorry. previous slide it has frozen so now uh, you are seeing this moses technology slide no 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 that's why you yes, went yeah. to the next topic but we are seeing the previous slide only the calcium oxalate the different types of stones that's it has frozen at that so can you just you, shut down and come back yeah. stop okay, sharing I, and again start sharing okay i think abhishek if you are uh, okay the, i'll again try to share the screen no no now it's coming what can you see now now you go to the uh, total you can uh, see the fragmentation slide full screen go to the full screen mode <laughs> yeah yeah okay you can see this moses technology slide no yeah, but, it is, but it's in slide mode yeah can't you can't see the slides now or oh, really sorry for this is a slide but you can't see your slides full screen you have to do full screen i am on full so screen only show mode sir we can't mm -hmm. see slide show mode sir oh god uh, abhishek if you are ready then i think you can please share then i will try to rectify the problem okay sir i can do it so now i think uh, we have i will uh, stop sharing the screen okay, abhishek you can go ahead with your presentation dr abhishek is going to talk about uh, lower polar stone and uh, abhishek over to you <clears throat> thank you very much sir am i audible and my slides visible yes very well yeah very much So, uh, a very good morning to all the viewers. I'm Dr. Abhishek Singh. I will be talking about uh, management of lower calcial stones using RIRS. I have nothing to disclose. So, I would be first talking about the relevant anatomy, how it impacts the management of uh, lower uh, polar stone using RIRS. Understanding of your scope, understanding the technicalities of relocation. then demonstration of in situ fragmentation managing difficult situations and knowing your limits so why discuss lower polar stones in context of rirs there is a intrinsic limitation of deflection of all the flexible ureteroscopes accessories further decrease the deflection the failure rate decreases by 21 to 42% due to the inability to access the lower pole the irrigation significantly decreases by 78% when you use baskets which are as small as 2 french and with larger baskets this may go down to by 99% so which case would you select for a lower polar access using an rirs so when you consider the anatomy the important things that you need to consider are the infundibulo pelvic angle the infundibular width and the infundibular length also an important thing that you always uh, should think about is the parenchyma at the lower pole between the ureter and the lower polar infundibulum so this is uh, this is the amount of uh, meat that your scope has to traverse um, in order to reach the lower pole so let us discuss a few index situations so look at this index case so this is an index situation where there is a 17 mm maximum uh, dimension stone which is of hounsfield unit 1548 uh, 
in the drain in the delayed film you see that the ureter is a little cock screwed so these are the issues that the initial ivu should bring you to your notice if you look at the infundibular configuration the first thing that you need to assess is the infundibular length so in this particular case is 13.8 mm we'll just keep this in mind for the moment look at the infundibular width it is about 9.3 mm so all our scopes are typically 2.5 mm to 3 mm in size and some of them may go at the most up to 3.5 mm so the ideal infundibular width should admit the tip of the scope as well as it should give some area around the scope so that you can have a return of fluid that is when you will be able to maintain a decent amount of vision the third and the most probably the most important thing that you need to figure out is the infundibular pelvic angle so infundibular pelvic angle is the angle that is a uh, form with by the midpoint of the uh, perpendicular drawn at the midpoint of the pelvis and the perpendicular drawn through the cup of the calyx along adjoining the in uh, lower polar infundibulum so in this particular case it is 92.6 so this this case as far as the axis is going to be concerned is going to be easy because the infundibulum width is wide that is about uh, 9 mm the length is short the angle that one has to negotiate is also uh, relatively obtuse so it is going to be an easy axis similarly consider this particular situation here we have a stone again at the lower pole the maximum mm -hmm. density is about 1417 hu the length of the stone is about 13.2 mm but the infundibular pelvic angle is slightly narrow in this particular situation it is about 78 deg uh, degrees the infundibular width is 4.4 and infundibular length is again 18 mm so if you combine all the factors if the infundibular pelvic angle still stays to be favorable because anything which is more than 38 degrees is very very fine so as this angle or the, there is crowding at the level of lower pole then the chances of your axis become difficult the infundibular width in this particular case may be a problem so it would be fair to say that when you are assessing a case what you need to consider is density of the stone anything which is more than 1000 hu is going to take more time so you cannot keep a, your scope bent for a longer time considering the infundibular pelvic angle is a very very important thing if the angle is acute absolutely acute like as it uh, in, goes near 30 degrees the case is going to be more and more difficult and as it approaches 90 degrees the axis is going to be easier what about infundibular length infundibular length like we if we keep a cut off of 25 mm the less than 25 mm it is going to be e um, possible when it is less than 15 mm it is going to be easy when you decide about the infundibular width whenever the width is more than 7 8 mm the axis is going to be relatively easy when the width is about less less than 5 mm it is going to be difficult stone size and volume are very very important determinants any stone size more than 15 mm is going to take longer time so you have to plan your uh, case based on these particular variables in fact people have developed scores so uh, one particular score comes abhishek considers... sorry to interrupt you yes. abhishek yes. your slides are not moving so which slide i am there index, index situation 2 yes sir i am at the index situation 2 only sir i am speaking on index yeah, yeah. okay okay so index so there are scores which consider density Uh, infundibular pelvic angle infundibular length and stone volume as far as the stone volume is concerned it is very important as size as as uh, once you the size goes more than uh, 15 mm and volume reaches about 120 it becomes very very difficult so if you look at this meta analysis and you look at the um, look at the stone free rates using these particular variables infundibular pelvic angle is the single most important variable <clears throat> whenever there was stone free rate were definitely higher 
in the subgroup where the infundibulo pelvic angle was more than 38 uh, degrees and it was very very less whenever the infundibulo pelvic angle was less than 30 degrees in this particular meta analysis they could not find any difference when it comes to infundibular length but uh, we can imagine a situation uh, like um, uh, say adpkd where they will get a very very long uh, length of the lower polar infundibulum that is the situation where our scopes may not be able to reach the lower pole so definitely infundibular length more than 25 mm is a variable what about infundibular width whenever this is less than 5 mm your scope may not be able to enter the lower pole only therefore infundibular width should always be considered operative time whenever you think that the operative time is going to be less than 1 hour it is going to be possible to do with the whole case in 1 hour that is the time when you should actually attempt a lower polar stone using rirs so <clears throat> once you have understood the anatomy and got your bearings right selected a proper case now it is also important to know that how your scope is going to behave in the milieu that you are going to work into so let us understand some measurements first the relative length of all the scopes is about 65 to 67 cm which is fine but you must all consider the flexible tip that every scope has this may have a bearing in when you are going to negotiate the lower pole so if you look, look at look at the scopes typically the average length of the flexible uh, tip is about 7 cm and this can range anywhere between 5.5 to 7 cm the importance of this particular fact is that the lesser the, the flexible tip the smaller circle the scope is going to make when you do a complete 270 degree flexion or deflection uh, the other uh, other way around when the flexible tip is long say about 7 cm or more this circle is going to be more the the implication that this is going to have is that whenever you are working with an axis sheath placed just at the puj or just below the puj you may not be able to get the complete flexion of the scope so if th that is happening the tip is to move your axis sheet down by 1 or 2 cm and then you will be able to get a good deflection what about the exit of the fiber the exit of the accessory channel is very important <laughs> when you are dealing with the lower polar stones so if you are like working in the right kidney the axis at 9 at 3 o'clock looks more uh, appealing when you are working in the left kidney the axis at 3 o'clock appears more appealing this is more so relevant while doing the flexion in the lower pole then testing the deflection of your scope so there are two aspects to uh, this particular concept so deflection one is what deflection your scope has that means does it have a at least a 270 degree deflection on both sides if yes you are probably in a good shape to enter the lower calyx if not then you consider other options another thing is what deflection your scope has at this particular moment the seller may have told you that it deflects for 270 degrees but now you used it for 15 or 20 cases but does it have the same deflection so check the deflection of the scope that you have if it is deflecting with an accessory to 270 to at least 245 degrees then it is worthwhile attempting a lower polar stone so knowing your scope is very very important now take what are the technicalities that you need to deal with when you are dealing with a lower polar stone so i would Richard, say we have two two three minutes to go maximum two minutes okay yes and i will be able to finish in three minutes so technicalities of relocation are very important first thing is you have to learn how to basket the stone so basketing the stone is that uh, all the lower polar stones can be basketed but what basket to use is very very important if the stone is mobile you choose a basket which can go all around so you use an <clears throat> end circle if the stone is stuck to a particular corner then you use a basket which does not close onto the stone but holds it by the side like engage or dakota so that that is the importance of choosing a particular Uh, basket another thing is maneuvering the scope when you engage the stone with a basket so if you can watch my uh, finger go once you engage the stone in lower pole you just push the whole assembly cranially by about a centimeter this will disengage the stone out of the lower calyx and now you gradually deflect if you start deflecting the the moment you engage then the stone is not going to come out 
<clears throat> so this is the discussion about a relocation uh, proper so here the exit of my uh, basket is at 9 o'clock i grasp the stone and then gradually deliver it to the upper pole as you can see in this particular video demonstration and once it is in uh, the upper pole you can disintegrate it by the techniques that kandap sir is going to describe uh, another <clears throat> situation that you need to uh, think of is uh, when you have to use an instrument where the accessory is coming at 3 o'clock so again you grasp this particular stone so this situation more often than not will be in a right kidney where you will have uh, using a scope with the accessory coming at 3 o'clock and then disengage the scope uh, using uh, using the knuckle of the scope just push it cranially and then again reflex the scope that is how you will be able to transfer the stone to the upper pole so once the stone is in upper pole then you can choose the choice of disintegration uh, you like here i am doing a dusting and then eventually i <laughs> complete it with a pop dusting there can be difficult situations so look at this particular situation it is a early bifeding with the lower polar calyx being very very long so this is a typical situation where the infundibular length is more than 25 mm so in this situation you may not be able to use the knuckle maneuver so what you need to do is that gradually deflex the scope after engaging the stone once it is in the pelvis then you straighten your scope again regrasp the stone and then transfer it to an appropriate calyx so this uh, this situation can be a difficult situation and um, the, why we have attempted uh, or why we are demonstrating this particular situation is that even though infundibular length is more here the infundibular pelvic angle is not very steep what about in situ fragmentation yes in situ fragmentation is a possibility so uh, what you would do is so this particular situation the stone was actually in the upper uh, upper ureter but he required a digestenting then it got migrated to the lower pole and here you can see the stone is in the lower pole you because the infundibular pelvic angle is not much you bend your scope visualize the stone and go on fragmenting the stone here i am using a tfl with 0.1 joules and 200 hertz a complete dusting has been achieved and com a complete clearance achieved what about lower polar axis with reference to exit of fibers earlier we discussed an exit of uh, an accessory namely basket here are two situations where we are working in lower pole with exit of uh, at 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock so on the right side as i said and the 3 o'clock works well <clears throat> and the left side the 9 o'clock works well when you extend the indications like when you extend the size you don't ex extend the indications on all the facets like a dense stone a large stone a narrow infundibular pelvic angle a long infundibulum these you should not do these stones so here if you look at this particular stone the stone is 2.5 cm but the infundibular pelvic angle is favorable the stone is only 600 uh, 683 hu so the you extend one or two indications not all and also once the stone is protruding in pelvis you keep lazing in the direction of the lower calyx so at a point you will be able to disengage the stone into the into the pelvis and then you can gradually with the scope push the uh, push the stone into superior calyx and work so this is the clearance at one month so what what happens is that uh, we try to extend the indications on all accounts whenever we do this we, are, we ought to fail so look at this particular situation so the infundibulum is infundibular length is very very long the stone though small is very hard and you have to work at around 30 cent 30 mm of infundibular length so eventually you are trying to do a basketing and not able to complete a basketing so we had to convert this particular case into a mini pearl the basket is just not reaching the stone as you can see in this particular video demonstration so what i would say is that understanding of the anatomy is the key to perform rirs in lower polar stone with the advancement in instrumentation its use is increasing and indications being extended relocation techniques require patience and diligent assistance better deflecting scopes finer fibers and powerful lasers enable in situ fragmentation 
realizing what is technically technically possible is very important part of patient care as far as rirs is concerned thank you for a patient listening thank you dr abhishek uh, for a nice talk and i think uh, nanjapa now i will try to i will try to share my screen if my slide moves it's okay if it doesn't move then we'll move on okay uh, nanjapa can you see the slide now dr nanjapa yeah we can see yourself yeah we can see now just see that whether you can see the videos also or not is it uh, can you see the video no you are not on uh, you know slide show you have to go to slide show i am on a full screen my dear so we can see no, only the seeing that how you edit a powerpoint we can see that mode so we can go ahead with that mode only yeah you we can, can go ahead the... with that mode why can't you can play the video in that mode sir okay just just hold on i think can you see the slide or not right yeah, now now we can see yeah which is right. a full screen yes sir we can st still can yeah, see the video you can see it. and the slide is moving right now no sir no slides are not moving no sir no okay oh, anyway i think um, i don't know what is the problem because i can see my slides moving here but so what we do is that let me uh, just talk to you a little bit of theory and uh, i think we can uh, call it a day for because we have more sessions to go on so i was talking to you about uh, moses technology uh, conta has come out with a virtual basket technology and moses is a technology patented technology by luminous now according to uh, moses technology the pulse is generated in such a way that two successive pulses are generated the first pulse which is the short uh, low energy pulse which will produce a small vapor bubble which is an oblong in shape and this vapor bubble causes the parting of the water this and the rest of the energy is passed which will pass through this vapor bubble and reach to the stone target so this in turn will produce effective delivery of laser energy to the stone fragment and stone will be fragmented or dusted similarly conta has come out with a virtual basket or and a vapor tunnel technology in that the pulse is generated in two succession the first pulse will produce a small vapor bubble it expands and then it collapses and it ruptures before it ruptures it produces a negative suction which will draw the stone fragment towards the laser fiber tip and then the energy is liberated the second energy is liberated and that will produce the fragmentation so this is a virtual basket this is as if you are using a basket to hold the stone these are the pulse modulation technology called described by uh, the invented by the luminous as well as the quanta now when you are talking about laser you have to understand there are three important parameters of a laser machine one is the energy it is the amount of pulse energy delivered with every single optical pulse which is mainly responsible for the fragmentation of the stone the more the energy more the fragmentation that can also produce a more retropulsion and more fiber burn back second is frequency these are the number of pulses delivered in one second so more the frequency speedier is the procedure so it is mainly uh, important for the speed of the procedure the third most important parameter is a pulse duration in which it is the duration of the time taken to deliver the pulse energy with every single optical pulse so if the pulse duration is short large amount of energy is delivered to the stone in a very short period that's why it will produce a nice fragmentation so when you want to produce a fragmentation you have to keep this pulse duration short and when you want to produce a pulse uh, the dusting in that case the pulse duration has to be a very long pulse duration in a low power laser sometimes the machine has got a preset so if you put it on a dusting mode automatically machine will adjust to a long pulse in a high power laser you have a possibility to adjust the pulse duration as per your desire 
Now, so coming to the cases now, the first is the fragmentation. When the stone is less than one centimeter in size, I would like to fragment the stone. There are no perfect laser setting, but it is important to remember that when you want to fragment the stone, keep a low pulse, a low frequency, that is about six, starting with the six hertz, keep a high energy, that is 0.7 to one joule, and pulse duration has to be short for the fragmentation mode. The advantage is that it can produce a complete clearance very quickly because you can fragment one centimeter stone into five, six pieces, grab it with the basket and take it out. But the, what is the necessity? To take out the fragments, you'll have to have a urethral excess sheath in position. And secondly, you need to use a basket. When you want to produce a dust, like in larger stone from one centimeter to two stone, two centimeter, you start with a low energy, that is start with the 0.4 to 0.5 joules, higher frequency between 12 to 15 hertz and longer pulse duration. And the advantage is that maybe it is done without urethral excess sheet. You may not need a basket because you are dusting, but the dust size should be less than 250 micron. Then this dust will clear on its own without blocking the ureter with the fragments. And it is good for the moderate to large size of stone. Whenever you are producing a dust, once you see the stone, the idea is to chase this single stone, convert this large stone into a small stone. Don't try to fragment the stone in into the multiple pieces. Otherwise, you will keep on chasing all the fragments. So what you do is that go from the periphery to the center, reduce the stone, large stone into a small size. Once you reach to the center of the stone, then you have to fragment because then the dusting will be very difficult because the stone becomes very hard in the nucleus part. So then you fragment it into a few pieces, grab it with the basket and take it out. For the dusting, I adopt a painting technique. Painting means you start from the periphery, go towards the center, continuously move your laser fiber over the surface of the stone. This will produce a very fine dust. Second technique is a chipping technique. There you are nibbling the stone at the periphery. When you nibble the stone, the stone fragment size is less than one ml. This is how you will produce a dusting, either painting or chipping or a combination of both. Start with the lower settings and then gradually hike up the setting as per your desire. And the last thing is the pop dusting. In pop dusting, what you do is you use higher energy, higher frequency, and keep the laser fiber away from the stone and continuously fire the laser energy. When you do so, the whirlpool is created, and this whirlpool will bring the causes the fragmentation of the stone because of the collusion of the stone fragments with each other. And secondly, because of the delivery of the laser energy over the stone fragments. Pop dusting is good when you have got a very nice close calyx, not a very large capacity calyx. Otherwise, whirlpool will not be created. So these are the three practically methods, fragmentation, dusting, and pop dusting or popcorning, which is reserved for a stone more than two centimeter in size. So this is how you can produce a fragmentation or dusting of the stone. Mainly, we are talking about a holmium laser in today's time, but now the new kid on the corner is a thulium fiber laser, which is an excellent device at a good future, and it is good for the dusting, mainly in RIRS. Uh, it is not a very good fragmentation device because the, the power generated by this thulium fiber laser is less 500 watt. So, uh, thulium fiber laser is good for dusting, which is very quick. There is minimum retropulsion, and you have a possibility to use a very small caliber laser fiber. So in future, maybe the size of the flexible electroscope also will reduce, the diameter will also reduce, and the access to the upper pelvic aliceal system will be much, much easier. It is not a good device at this moment. With the limited experience, I can say that for impacted uretic stone, I think uh, it can cause the blanching of the uretic mucosa. So I'll keep reserve my holmium fiber laser for uh, holmium laser for the uretic stone and the PCNL mini PCNL RIRS. I'm still using the holmium fiber holmium laser, and according to the EAU guideline, still holmium laser is uh, advised 
thulium fiber laser will come into the play maybe after more experience more cases and there are some concerns regarding using thulium fiber laser but certainly it has got a good future so i think we'll stop here and we don't have any time for any um, any discussion because we have overshoot the time five by five minutes so i think uh, i thank all my panelists for being with me and i'm extremely sorry my only my video could not run uh, that's but that's the way it goes dr jawla i'm really sorry for this uh, go for i don't understand why this happened thank no you problem. so much kandarp you can answer the question in the chat box okay in what individual questions are there you can enter in the chat box uh, i think most of the questions are uh, answered by the um, uh, faculty during their talk and uh, uh, yeah. there is a question for dr abhishek which is the best investigation to measure the infundibulo uh, pelvic angle should we do a ct euro for every case of lower polar stone is uh, so ctib ctib is the best investigation uh, for measuring infundibulo pelvic angle uh, i realize that um, uh, the guidelines suggest only an ncct but there will be many occasions when you will be fooled by an ncct uh, as far as uh, the position and location of the stone is concerned Uh, if you you belong to the uh, group of thought process where you would not do a CT IBU, then uh, the distance between sto stone and the ureter uh, that will help you eyeball the uh, infundibulo pelvic angle. And secondly, then intraoperatively you will have to rely on your retrograde uh, to make a decision. In that case, uh, a patient should always be counselled that there is a possibility that we may not be able to uh, finish the case with RIRS. in that case we may either stent or if you agree we can go ahead with a mini pcnr okay uh, dr chawla any other question you have uh, no sir no thank you very much you? chawla i think we should start with the second yeah. module yeah all right thank you okay thank you keshav and thank you all my faculty thank you so much thank you thank you sir. thank you so thank you dr kandar thank you all the faculty for an excellent presentation of their uh, talks very illustrative very informative so may i invite now dr ramlingam for uh, the simulation based uh, teaching the module on laparoscopy and the robotic dr ramlingam over to you sir hello good over to you sir we can hear you yeah good morning uh, dr arun uh, at the outset i thank uh, the usi and uh, isu body for uh, interesting us to give a talk on this uh, laparoscopic simulators uh, i have a renowned faculty dr sedel he will talk on uh, uh, endo trainers and um, dr ganpule will talk on uh, virtual simulation and uh, dr uh, anantha krishnan will talk on uh, robotic virtual simulation so dr sendil has been with me for the last uh, 20 years uh, uh, with me giving the training for the uh, trainees which are about uh, 350 indian and uh, some around 50 people from outside country so he has vast experience in giving lectures and um, giving them the basic training uh, about the hand eye coordination how to use instruments and uh, all those things and now i hand over to dr sentil for his uh, talk dr sentil good morning uh, thanks to uh, usa and isu for giving me this opportunity i am going to be talking about simulation using inanimate objects now the first uh, step towards laparoscopy is uh, simulation and the first step of simulation is using an endo trainer the word simulation means using uh, a, pro a process which is as close as possible to the reality which means that we should be using similar instruments a similar camera a similar light source and similar monitor the only thing that will be different is the inanimate objects that we are going to use inside the endo trainer box so ideally an endo trainer box uh, the endo trainer uh, setup should be like this It, you should be using the monitor which you are going to use for the laparoscopy during your lap procedure you'll be using the same light source same uh, cable and the camera is the same as that what you're going to be using for laparoscopy and a telescope the only difference will be and the instruments will be the same the only difference will be that you'll be using a different type of a endo trainer box 
so the main purpose of having an enter trainer uh, training with the enter trainer is learning the hand eye coordination fortunately the urologists have already been using urethroscopy and uh, transurethral resection of the prostate using a camera and a monitor so they are quite uh, very uh, they are able to catch up with the procedure very easily so the only different thing that will be the instrument handling here the instruments mo movement of the instruments will be opposite to what we move outside so it takes a little bit to them for the uh, trainees to get used to the procedure now the main purpose of this uh, simulation is to reduce the learning curve and to simulate the live surgery so we get we get closer to doing a live surgery by the time we finish the end of the training procedures there are different types of enter trainers that are available the one in the center is the one which we have devised here in coimbatore i shall explain uh, in detail about it when we go to this particular uh, slide so the main concept is that the, there should be a coaxial arrangement of the surgeon the enter trainer box as well as the camera initially we start doing simple tasks like using the beads or doing a cobra drill and later on we go on to progress to complex tasks and then uh, complete the procedure with uh, suturing and once the suturing is uh, once you are quite familiar uh, with the suturing then we go to do complex things like animal models in the enter trainer box which uh, professor ramlingam will be talking to you about so this is the enter trainer box which we have uh, devised in our uh, in coimbatore it's got a very simple uh, design it's got three ports one through which the uh, the camera goes in and the two are the ports through which the instruments go in so uh, here the difference is that instead of using a telescope and a camera we use a web camera you can use the web camera which has got the best uh, uh, the resolution and the web camera is placed at the tip of the rod which is uh, the camera and uh, it can be moved inside and outside just like any camera and it can be focused also so that uh, excludes the usage of a expensive telescope as well as a uh, camera which will reduce the overall cost of the enter trainer box and once we have the enter trainer box we have a light source which is just a usually an led light source which is placed inside the box which is almost like a tube light inside the box and so it eliminates the need for a light cable a light uh, source as well as the uh, uh, the uh, light uh, and the light source and uh, generally uh, the enter trainer the the uh, the trainee is guided continuously by the mentor so we start off with uh, various procedures the first step is the bead picking and bead transfer here we have two bowls where different colored beads are placed and before starting the procedure we try to align the instruments in in position what i mean by aligning is when you take it out and put it through the port it must reach the point where we desire it to go so we try to do it several times so that you get used to the uh, movement and used to the type of insertion of the Uh, instrument into the area where we can see so uh, that is done initially and once you get familiar with that you can start doing the bead picking exercises the beads are of different colors and are of different uh, densities some of them may be pith balls some of them may be plastic some of them may be metal so we start uh, the uh, picking up the ball one by one use the rotator using the uh, uh, index finger and try to rotate the direction of the bead so that the second hand the right hand is able to catch it so uh, the other things that we can do to do to fine tune ourselves is to pick up the different colors at the same at one time like for example you can pick up the green beads uh, initially finish off with the green beads and place it at the desired point you can place it at the periphery of the bowl or you can place it at the center of the bowl and if the bead is a pith ball you must be holding it with a uh, uh, very minimal uh, pressure So that, it, so that it does not get uh, destroyed, and also learn to rotate the tip of the instrument using the index finger. So all these exercises can be learned while doing this uh, procedure. If it is a hard uh, bead like a plastic bead, it can slip uh, from the instrument. You must know how to hold it. So all that is uh, completed within about ten uh, to fifteen minutes, and within about an half an hour or so, the the reasonable amount of expertise is got in this uh, procedure. and once you are uh, familiar with this uh, doing this procedure you can do it with one one instrument on one camera and the other so that you can take the camera in and out with your left hand and use the instrument to hold the bead and to carry it from one bowl to the other bowl so this is uh, once this is completed we will move on to the uh, next exercise which is called as the uh, cobra drill 
here we have a, a thread uh, which is a string which is placed in the middle of the field and initially you try to align your instruments in such a way that you can reach the point where you want to reach you uh, you identify each of these uh, dots which are placed over the thread and try to reach those points and then uh, once you are quite uh, familiar and quite comfortable with doing that procedure you start off with holding the thread and then moving it and then uh, moving the other instrument on top of the other uh, the thread and pass it from one dot to the other and this is carried on till you are able to achieve a reasonable amount of confidence and uh, comfortable uh, uh, movement and then once you have completed uh, this you can hold the uh, thread and move it uh, up and down change see in all directions you assume that it's a, a piece of bowel you can uh, lift it you can uh, move the uh, see all the uh, different areas of the bowel the mesentery etc and you can make different shapes out of the uh, the thread and uh, like for example you can make a circle or you can make a heart shape you can even make a knot with the help of this you can lift it up and then transfer it from one hand to the other and so uh, within a short while you will be able to gain some some more and a coordination some more control over the rotation of the tip some more understanding of the movement of the instruments so once this is completed uh, we move on to the uh, next uh, level of uh, the uh, the endo trainer exercises this is the orange peel dissection where we fix the orange to the uh, board with the help of a thread then start dissecting in the avascular plane so this uh, helps us to know what amount of pressure and what amount of uh, movement you have to do generally it's advisable to do small multiple movements rather than large movements uh, in, uh, in the in laparoscopy and that is followed here and you go into the avascular plane and make sure that the juice does not spill out you can complete the entire uh, the orange and pe peel off all the different uh, lobes into bits and then maybe you can make a incision over the medial part of the orange and then take out the seeds also so this helps us to understand the dissection aspect the movement of the tip of the instrument and how to make small movements repetitive movements without any disturbance to the uh, other uh, tissues then once that is completed you you reach a level of expertise you can start off with your uh, suturing uh, while well, uh, most of these uh, needles are all self mounting self riding needles but uh, generally with the laparoscopy you should learn to how to mount the needle initially and then uh, initial suturing is done with the 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 ends uh, the cut end vertically so that it's a little bit easier uh, we learn how to make the loop how to put in the uh, the instrument through it and how to hold the tip of the thread and how to draw it inside so when you when you pull the thread you make sure both the instruments are at right angles make sure that the both instruments are holding the thread at equidistant and uh, adequate amount of tension or adequate amount of pressure is given the haptics are all quite okay when we are using laparoscopy whereas you will learn that in uh, robotics there is no haptics there so that the uh, the tension and the pressure that you are going to do with each knotting will be different which will be uh, which should be in our mind and we should make sure it doesn't snap off the thread so we once we do the suturing in the vertical manner you can move the lint cloth into the transverse manner and then start uh, doing it in the transverse manner and it's very important to also, also here you can see that the the needle has been held in a different angle then use the other instrument to mount the uh, needle in the proper manner use the uh, uh, then uh, you can also learn to do the suturing in the right hand as well as the left hand both for forehand as well as backhand it's very important because the tissue the in a laparoscopy the the tip of the needle does not move in seven directions so it is very important that we are able to uh, hold the needle exactly perpendicular to the tissue so that you can complete the uh, suturing process without much difficulty so it is better to learn with both the right hand with the left hand as well as the forehand suturing as well as the backhand suturing so once uh, you have completed all the suturing you are ready for uh, the next level of endo trainer uh, exercises but it's very important uh, more than the validation and certificated certification the self appraisal is more important regular and devoted uh, training and continuation of the training is important maybe you can buy an endo trainer box and keep it in your ot so that whenever you have free time you go ahead and then start doing some dissection or start doing some suturing so that you can develop your skill further uh, in our center we have been conducting these uh, laparoscopy training programs for the last 22 years or so 
uh, that we had about two to three uh, sessions every year. Unfortunately, the last year, because of the COVID situations, we could not have. About uh, 340 urologists have gone through this training. We had more than 40 animal lab training uh, sessions done. And at the end of the uh, procedure, uh, at the end of the training, uh, we get a self-evaluation from all the trainees saying how comfortable they are, how much they have, uh, how much of skill level they have attained, and whether they will be, they'll be confident enough to start off the laparoscopy procedure after the Eurolab training program. And uh, then uh, uh, they move on to the next level of training. I uh, invite uh, Professor Ramlingam to uh, start off this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sentil, for uh, your uh, uh, detailed talk on uh, endotrainer exercises. Uh, it's very, very essential. Uh, uh, everyone who aspires to learn laparoscopy goes through rigorous training and then keep on doing it whenever they have time in the outpatient. You can just have a box and then uh, it's so very cheap when you have a, a web camera and then uh, you don't even need your assistant to hold the camera. And any ordinary monitor is good enough to uh, help you. So that way, uh, a strong foundation is essential. Even today, if you have time, we do something like a vascular suturing, all those things, whenever we have time. After 32 years of laparoscopic uh, experience also, even now, every five minutes, if you have, then that is very useful. So I'm going to cover um, uh, the uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, simulation modules uh, uh, in the next level. That is, uh, you can uh, use materials out of uh, chicken skin. You can uh, design like a pelvis, suture it and then reverse it to make it like a pelvis. And the intestine, spatulated intestine can mimic like a spatulated ureter. So you can learn something like a suturing model of a pyloplasty. So you can use continuous suture, interpret suture, and use uh, braided suture and uh, absorbable monofilament suture and see uh, which works better. But the ultimate aim is to just use enough of pressure in holding the tissue like ureter. The pelvis, you can hold it. For the ureter, you have to be gentle. And then uh, the most important thing is you have to take sutures in an equidistant manner. The co-option should be our aim, so that there, there is not much of extravasation. And you should uh, learn to adjust the needle by just uh, pitching it on the tissue, or even, you can see here that I'm not holding the ureter, but adjusting the movement of the needle. So all these uh, basic uh, suturing technique one has to monitor so that you'll be comfortable in doing the reconstructive procedures like pyloplasty, reimplantation, and so on. Now we have a, a, a model made out of a bull's kidney, a fresh uh, slaughtered bull's kidney with a, a vessel which is mimicking like a ureter. You can spatulate it and then uh, do the suturing. You can practice stenting also and then continue with uh, suturing. So these are all the tissues which are easily available uh, uh, when you go to the slaughterhouse. Now we have uh, made a model of uh, bladder and ureter using the gullet of the chicken. You can put a Foley catheter inside and then tie the other end so that uh, there is no leak. You can fill up the bladder as and when you want and uh, do a suturing model like that of a reimplantation. At the end, you can fill up the bladder and see whether your suturing is watertight. So any tissue available easily, you can make use of it. This is again a, a kidney from a freshly slaughtered uh, a big animal. And then all the lobules luckily look like a, a tumor. It is bulging out. So these lobules can be handled very gently with a, a non-dominant hand and then you can use cold scissor cutting and then keeping the sheet uh, uh, capsule like, uh, like in the live partial nephrectomy. And you just see how you are retracting, you are not holding the tissue. 
On the other hand, you are gently retracting to give a view of the area which is going to be cut. This you have to master because you don't have a seven degree of freedom movement like in the robot. If you want to do a comfortable suturing, then you need to adjust the uh, tissue rather than adjusting the tip of the uh, instrument. So if you have a calyx coming on your way, then you can transfix and you can put in methylene blue and see whether there is any leak also. And now comes the arena raffi. You can use a vehicle with a cinching technique using the Himala clips. And then uh, you just see how you give the counter traction. Traction, counter traction is the basic requirement in laparoscopy. So that you continue to uh, practice. And then you see you have to reverse suture at the end to get a proper alignment of the parenchyma. So this way you can practice the partial nephrectomy suturing. Again, here you have the bladder and the urethra of a big animal. You can divide the bladder neck and then make a model like a urethra vesicle suturing. And you can use continuous suture or interrupt suture as you like it. Here we are using the continuous suture using the 3 O vitrile. Once the posterior wall of the bladder is sutured, then you can insert the Foley catheter. Then continue suturing. Here it is going to be a little tough because you need to do the suturing with the backhand suture. Sometimes you may need to use the left hand. And then uh, it has to be equidistant because uh, you don't want any extravasation. And once the urethral vesicle anastomosis area is completed, then the redundant cystotomy can be sutured like a racket handle suture. So that way you make a waterproof anastomosis. And at the end, you can fill up the bladder and see whether there is any leak. So now the racket handle suturing is uh, completed. And the bladder is getting filled up now. There is not much of leak of urine. And then you can uh, use the intestine of a big animal, like that of uh, IVC. If you remember, if you are uh, going to do a, a radical nephrectomy with uh, thrombectomy, you have to do a, a cavotomy. So use the satin ski, laparoscopic satin ski, and do the cavotomy. Then you can use a monofilament like a 5O proline, and then do the continuous suture. You see how the needle adjusts the thread. That you have to learn to prevent dog ear. You can use a single layer suture, or you can use a, a reverse uh, suture with the left hand so that you have a two layer suture. It, it will be uh, much more uh, uh, watertight. And then at the end, you can ligate the uh, uh, intestine on both the sides with a Foley catheter inside, and then fill it up and see whether it is watertight. Now it is getting distended. You can see the flow. There is no leak. All these small, small uh, materials can be procured and similarly, this is a urethrolithotomy model. We can place a stone inside the chicken intestine and then do the uh, urethrolithotomy model. Here, the, the final one and the most uh, difficult one is the uh, vascular anastomosis. You can use the Gore-Tex graft, a wider one uh, mimicking like axonaliac artery, and the narrow one mimicking like a renal artery or a renal vein then you can do the continuous suture using the Gore-Tex suture. The advantage of Gore-Tex suture is it uh, doesn't have memory. Contrary to proline, uh, where there is a memory and then you will not be able to comfortably suture. So you sometimes you need to do a, a backhand suture, left-hand suture. So ultimately, it has to be uh, watertight. So that completes the vascular suture. You can see at the end like this. And then we uh, go on to 
animal lab simulation. Like in a uh, lab done in nephrectomy, we can practice uh, uh, nephrectomy, mentor the trainees to do uh, colonic mobilization and uh, mobilizing the kidney, and then uh, skeletonizing the vessels, vein, and then artery. And then you can uh, ask them to apply the bulldog clamps if you are planning to do a partial nephrectomy. So you have to be very gentle and all the instruments will have to move in very, very uh, fine movements. We can insert a bulldog clamp to apply on the artery and then on the way and then uh, make them practice the partial nephrectomy also. Once you are familiar with the uh, lap nephrectomy, then uh, they can be mentored uh, to do the uh, partial nephrectomy, renarathy, keeping the bolster, all the steps like in the real scenario, and then entrapment of the specimen, all this will be uh, taught in a systematic manner. Also, we can uh, train them to do the uh, retropetranscopy. You just have to go behind the uh, animal uh, at the spine area and then uh, do a finger dissection to create the space and then use the balloon to do the uh, retropetranscopic uh, procedures. Other models which are used for simulation is uh, cadaver. The problem with the uh, former in, uh, em uh, embalmed cadaver is the tissues are rigid and you don't get a real space within the peritone cavity and the tissues are much more rigid. It, it is not uh, pliable at all. So there is one um, uh, uh, solution called pyrrolidin. If that pyrrolidin is used to embalm, then the tissues become a little more supple. You can see the insufflation uh, reasonably satisfactory. And then you can uh, see the tissues are also reasonably OK. Nevertheless, it cannot uh, mimic like uh, human tissues. And uh, that way, we can um, uh, still uh, practice cadaver uh, uh, training. But the thing is, it is not easily available. It's very, very expensive. So that is why we have devised uh, more cheap models using the web camera, which is so very uh, economic. And then every day, everywhere, we can practice. Whether in OR or in the o OP, you can practice. So that com completes my talk. And then now I will invite my uh, co-faculty, Aravind Ganpule, who is uh, known to everybody, is very uh, passionate about the uh, laparoscopy and robotic. He will talk on virtual simulation. Gunplay, Aravind? Yes, sir, I'm here. I'm here. Sir, can you stop sharing so that I, I'll, I'll yeah, start yeah, sharing? Stop sharing. You can go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, at the outset, uh, I must put it on record that I am extremely honored to be uh, as a faculty alongside Professor Ramlingam, who is considered to be a pioneer in uh, laparoscopic teaching. Thank you very much, Professor Arun Chawla, Professor Keshav Murthy, and Professor uh, Sood for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, I have been given the opportunity, uh, the task of talking something about virtual simulations. There is a small disclaimer from my side that I have been involved in virtual simulations in endourology. I have seen as well as participated in a number of virtual simula simulation programs, but my uh, experience is very limited. Uh, before we go ahead, a number of things have been talked over the past one and a half hours, uh, particularly regarding the changing landscape of training as far as endurology and laparoscopy is concerned. We all, all have talked about the health study model of C1, D1, and TH1, wherein the essential components are a and, are and mentor and a trainee. Uh, this was uh, this uh, this later on went out to get uh, graduated into an apprenticeship model wherein it was an on job training particularly useful in open surgery and it is very very essential and important particularly because in open surgery part of the surgery is done by uh, the trainee and then it becomes very uh, easy for skill transfer. But for laparoscopy, we required structured programs, and as elegantly demonstrated by both Dr. Senthil and, and Dr. Ram, Ramlingam, we require models. And uh, two types of models have been uh, very nicely and eloquently described, but I'll be talking about the pros and cons of simulation-based models. 
uh, we have seen this slide multiple times that pilots are trained on simulation and so the number of accidents come down. And I completely agree with this particular notion that yes, simulation, as it helps pilots, it also helps us as surgeons. Uh, before we go ahead, there are three levels of human behavior whenever learning is concerned. Uh, the first thing is that you have to develop your skills. So it is called a skill-based uh, behavioral learning. For example, suturing. Uh, the second level is rule-based. Like suppose you want to do a nephrectomy. There are seven, eight golden steps of nephrectomy, port placement, boil reflection, and ending up, ending up the travel, hilar dissection included. So that is rule-based, uh, this thing. And the final one is knowledge-based behavior. That is controlling and particular situations, such as control of bleeding, con having a perception about the spatial orientation, then say uh, dealing with cert certain stressful situations. And I personally feel that knowledge-based behavioral learning is very important when we are talking about virtual simulation. Simulation, of course, should encom encompass all three. Uh, so uh, talking about simulation, that is virtual simulation-based uh, training, it mitigates the ethical issues associated with the Halstedian model, and it is a very effective tool to acquire and refine their technical skills. Uh, we talked very detail about the laparoscopic training tools. Uh, both of uh, both Professor Ramlingam and Dr. Senthil have talked about the box trainers, uh, uh, worried about hybrid simulators. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about these two, that is the virtual reality simulators and the augmented reality simulators. But before go we are going there, let us understand, because a number of PG trainees are here, that what are the advantages and disadvantages of the box trainer? Obviously, the cost, it is very low. However, the limitation is that they lack objective assessment. So this particular thing is overcome by these hybrid simulators wherein you have got a combination of both, wherein objective metrics are used for assessing the laparoscopic performance. Going a little bit further, apart from this, apart from uh, the assessment of objective metrics, multiple task explanations can also be given in virtual reality simulators as well as augmented reality. So the difference in between these two is that it appears as if you are immersed into that particular thing. Virtual simulation will not allow you to get immersed in the situation, but augmented reality will allow you to get immersed into the situation. Uh, uh, and uh, I would like to say that the most important uh, thing about this thing is that the limitation is the cost. I'll let you know about the cost aspect as we go along. The laboratory models uh, have been described. Uh, there are numerous models. Uh, I must really miss uh, it is very impressive the number of models we have, we have seen in the last uh, last talk. This is a similar model developed at our center, which is called as the chicken pyloplasty model. Almost a similar one developed from the crop of the chicken. And of course, cadaver models we have also discussed. So going further, why is it essential to have a virtual simulation plat platform? Uh, let me tell you that there are very few platforms which actually deal with uh, laparoscopic urology simulation. Most of them are for cholestectomies, uh, sigmoidectomies, as well as in gynecology as well. But what, what are the results of these studies in, from those specialties is that it helps both juniors as well as seniors. And most important, it has got phase content uh, as well as predictive validity in all these simulators. So what ideally we want is that we want to see this particular uh, thing wherein uh, we can do a procedure in the exact same way that we do in a live surgery. For instance, the first step of uh, the reflection of the boil. Apart from that particular lack of uh, haptic feedback, which has been overcome in certain situations, we also have got these particular simulators wherein uh, you have got uh, wherein you got the uh, highly immersive vision using the gear simulation. As you can see, uh, as most of the simulations are for uh, cholestectomies, some of them are for uh, uh, sigmoidectomies. As you see here, that the head gear has been inserted. So you go as if you are inside the abdomen, you are opt operating on a robot. But what is a value added addition is that these simulators come with a uh, virtual 3D operating room. So as I was discussing that uh, more important than uh, just developing the, uh, the uh, skill-based uh, skill things such as suturing, we also have to understand that the surgeon also needs to know, has to develop certain other skills as well, as to what is the suture material required, what is the height of the table that should be kept, how should be the instruments held. So all these things can be brought out through a virtual reality simulator. Most important, it also gives a three degree, uh, 360 degree spherical view of the, uh, the whole operating room. Of course, in a virtual uh, setting, you can see that the surgeon uh, will be able to, uh, the, sorry, the mentor will be able to assess what is the response of a surgeon to a particular given emergency, what suture material will the surgeon ask for if there is an 
uh, what is the size of the suture material the surgeon is going to ask, ask for everything will be recorded uh, like here for instance is asking raise the table of the operating uh, raise the height of the operating table for uh, for say 6 cm or so so all this is recorded and finally the metrics are developed and finally uh, finally the assessment is done I must uh, acknowledge that this particular video uh, I have taken from the LabSIM uh, uh, website. Uh, different varieties of virtual simulators that are available are the following. Uh, all these six are the market players as far as virtual simulators are go. Uh, they go. However, how do we differentiate between all of them? Like uh, only two of them have got a haptic feedback. That is something which is lost vis-a-vis uh, -vis box trainers. The haptic feedback is lost whenever there is a virtual uh, virtual trainer. And uh, as one more one more disadvantage, as I was talking, is that most of the trainer uh, trainer uh, trainers, virtual reality trainers, are for GI surgery and general surgery. But there are only two in the market. That is Lab Mentor 3D Systems. That is Symbionics. Uh, Symbionics, the same one uh, which develops the PCNL model as well as the flexible electroscopy model. But you can see at the uh, at the at the costing, one particular simulator will cost approximately uh, 100,000 US dollars. The second market player is uh, LabSIM, and uh, they boast of this particular specification that they have got essence and haptic system feedback. So this is a very important thing that the surgeon will have an haptic feedback, but again, the cost is an factor a little bit uh, cheaper than the previous version. Uh, these two uh, simulators, the Cimento and the Lab Mentor, lack the haptic feedback. So I personally feel that they don't have much advantages, uh, advantage over the box trainer. Uh, to give my last word, I would like to uh, actually rephrase my last word as following. I would like to say that what is the further research uh, to rephrase it? What is unknown about virtual simulation that we need to know? We should know that the effect of virtual reality simulation training on performance in context of advanced laparoscopic procedure is really unknown. We, we are just assuming it. The effect of virtual reality simulation training on knowledge-based behavior is unknown. We need to understand how a surgeon responds in a particular given stressful situation. Uh, we don't know whether this will extrapolate into a good patient outcome. That is not known. We need, we need uh, randomized studies. Uh, the standardization is not there. The synergistic effect with mental training is not there. That is something what was expected from virtual reality simulation. The spatial perception is also not there. What we expect from any training device, maybe it may be box trainer, animate, inanimate, or even cadaveric models, we require to transfer these skills from the laboratory to the OR. If any given uh, model will uh, offer us this one, then I feel that model is successful. So uh, the question I ask is, is virtual reality simulation present? Uh, do they present a new paradigm in surgical, surgical education? And after going through a little bit of literature, I feel that it offers the possibility of training without the use of real patients. Definitely, that is a plus point. Simulation provides a mean of risk-free learning in complex, critical, or rare situations, as well as promoting team-based approaches. Because as you saw in the 360-degree OR, it uh, particularly fulfills this objective. And finally, it plays a significant role in outcome of assessment and accreditation. Thank you very much, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Arvind, uh, for your uh, 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 lecture. It was uh, to the point, and uh, I, I hope uh, people will have an idea about uh, the what's a virtual simulator and uh, how is it different from the conventional uh, simulator training and uh, how much uh, uh, can we afford to have it and when the institution probably can have it and then everyone can go there and get uh, a hands on. So thank you very much for that and now uh, I have the person duty of uh, inviting Anand uh, to give the talk on uh, robotic uh, simulation. Anand? Yes sir, uh, I'm here. Let me just uh, share my screen. All of you are aware that Anant is a robotic surgeon. I got an exclusive robotic uh, center at Chennai and a uh, uh, very nice person to be in touch with. Anyone <laughs> who wants to learn a little bit about a robotic, feel free to go to him on his behalf, I am telling. So thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, yes, sir, am I audible, sir? Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, see my slides? Yes, we can. Yes, sir. So I uh, must start off by thanking Dr. Ramlingam uh, for uh, this uh, 
opportunity. I must also thank Dr. Chavla, uh, Dr. Keshwamurti, and Dr. Sood. Um, so before I start, uh, I'll tell you 20 years ago, I was a student uh, under Dr. Ramlingam in his laparoscopy course. As soon as I finished my uh, uh, I, general surgery, I was with Sir. And uh, I must also say that Sir was instrumental in me getting a robotic fellowship with Dr. Vip Patel in, uh, in Florida. So today I'm going to talk about uh, virtual simulation modules in robotic urology. And two parts of the talk, a lot of times I'm going to try and make this as useful to the trainees as possible. So when shifting from laparoscopy or open surgery to robotics and simulators and robotic training period. So do we need to learn laparoscopy? Uh, is it some part of it? Do we need to unlearn? What is the learning curve advantages and training pathways? And when we talk about simulators, I'll touch upon virtual simulation modules, importance of stimulators, advantages, and available simulator modules. So the first question to answer is, do we need laparoscopy when we go into robotics? And I think uh, the, uh, the lot of sur surgeons I've spoken to have uh, uh, different schools of thought. Some people say you don't need laparoscopy at all. Some people say you need uh, laparoscopy before going into robotics. But there is an objective evidence saying that people who have been trained in laparoscopy do well with robotics. So if there is a training pathway, I would suggest that all of us to move from step-by-step, step, go to laparoscopy and then go on to robotics. Directly going from open surgery to robotics is not as great as going to lap, lap and then to robotics. So there is a definite learning curve for robotic surgery and this slide is to um, show you all of that. So there's a learning curve for docking, learning curve for uh, individual procedures, as for 30 procedures, cystectomy again, 30, uh, partial uh, prostatectomy, the learning curve is progressively higher. And the onus is on us surgeons to uh, reduce this learning curve. So before we start operating on live patients, the onus is on us to be as comfortable as possible. And that is why a structured training program is essential before you go into uh, private practice. So is lab training useful? Definitely in terms of access, port placement, releasing additions, instrument handling, in potentially narrow spaces. And if a conversion is needed, you don't have to go to open, you can finish it with laparoscopy when a mechanical failure of the robotic system happens. So again, a lot of people have said very good laparoscopic surgeons find it difficult to learn robotics. And I beg to differ. If you're a very good laparoscopic surgeon, you can very easily get into robotics. And some of the steps you may need to change, but I think it's an advantage through and through learning laparoscopy before robotics. So I won't, yeah, what is the pathway of robotic training? And this is where I want to uh, concentrate on. So first is the introduction to the robotic system. Imagine a Formula One car uh, being driven in a, a racetrack. The first is learning the car. And next is learning how to drive around the track. So introduction to the robotic system, which is in-service training. How do you dock? How do you uh, put the, uh, how do you uh, attach the arms to the ports? And what, what do you have to learn about the robot? All that is very, very important before you start uh, uh, even virtual simulation. So necessarily an in-service training needs to be done. And this usually is done by the robotic uh, uh, people, the, the people who sell the robots to us, for instance, Da Vinci. Now you have other players in the market as well. So they will teach you about this in-service training of a robotic system. And the next is learning the learning more about the robot for which you will need to practice. And that is where the virtual simulators come in. And then case observations, uh, this is a structured training program. You need to observe cases, you need to have time as a bedside assistant, and then you need to uh, migrate onto a uh, console surgeon. So it is a stepwise structured training that you need to follow. And what are the advantages? It gives us an immersive environment, a virtual simulator. This is the Da Vinci simulator. And is a, it is a very important part of the learning experience. It provides us a controlled recreation of the steps and allows us to simulate our hand movements, leg movements, eye movements, everything is simulated. So uh, number one, it increases your familiarity. Number two, it gives trainees maximum exposure uh, to practice time and you know, with practice time and technical exposure. And then it also allows us to objectively assess each trainee before they go onto the robotic platform. And it also acts as a warm up for surgeons who are already using the robot. So what can we do in, for instance, in the Da Vinci system, they give you endo wrist manipulation. 
And that's something that you have to learn over and above lap. Camera control, clutching, energy control, fourth thumb control, needle driving, dissection, suture knotting. So, uh, and common procedure simulations, I'll touch upon this a bit later, but here's a video that shows us what exactly I mean by this. It looks like as children, we were all trained to put rings into different holes and so on, but this is exactly what we need to be comfortable with. So the amount of movement, amount of uh, pressure that we apply, all this is something that we will not be able to learn in real patients. So the camera always needs to be in the center, the, the instrument movement has to be very efficient and so on. So that is what the simulator can teach you. And this is needle driving again, very important, where to go in, where to come out, whether you can hold the needle with which, instru which instrument left or right at which particular point in time. All this a simulator can teach you and it will assess you and give you scores as well. So I think this is mandatory. Now, all of us can complete these exercises on day one. But the important thing is completing this exercise with a high score, which is dependent on how many times your hands clash, how, many, how slow you are during the procedure. So speed is not the uh, most efficient component of learning in a virtual simulator. It is the efficiency of movement, how, how quickly you are going through the uh, exercises without uh, touching your instruments, without the camera going out of the field and so on. It's not only the speed, but everything else. And finally, this comes with the machine, this word of warning here. The, uh, for this is the word part I wanted to, uh, the onus is on the physician to make themselves uh, as, uh, as proficient as possible in the robotic system before going ahead. So this is something that is very important. We have to understand that. I find that we're running a training program and I find that a lot of the uh, trainees who come in, as soon as they sit on the console for one day uh, in the virtual simulator, they think they're ready to go on to the uh, operating on the patients. But there is a definite time frame that you have to give before you go ahead and do this. Now, uh, a lot of people spoke, uh, Dr. Ramlingham spoke about uh, animal models. If you have cadaveric tissue, if you're a transplant unit, this is also something that is very important. Uh, and the point that I'm trying to make here is you don't need specific training instruments. You may be able to, at the end of the case, a little bit of cadaveric instruments, a, a, a tiny bit of suturing at the end of the case can be done uh, where you learn uh, with uh, instruments and this is a step up from a simulator. However much a virtual simulator can help you, it is not as good as real tissue when it comes to the movements. So a lot of times you may not be able to get these uh, tissues, but then PTFE graphs or anything is important because anything is can be used. Uh, if you have excess of that or, or uh, this sort of tissue, the advantage is, uh, like Dr. Sendel said, it helps us assess the amount of pressure that we can give onto the suturing tissues when you do it. Because in laparoscopy, you will be able to feel it relatively better. Um, but in robotics, you don't have the haptic feedback yet. So if you pull the tissue or pull the suture too much, you're going to tear the suture and snap it off. So you need to be able, this is a SID zero suture that we're trying to use. And you need to be able to uh, assess what level of uh, pressure you can give. And the visual cues are very important how much the tissue is tearing, how close it is coming and so on, will give you an idea of how to proceed. The next is uh, easily available stuff in every hospital. And uh, this is gloves and then um, such cell, and then you just, uh, or, you know, just start suturing with glove, glove bits and make sure that you don't tear the tissue when you're operating. So again, I'm just touching upon this uh, because each and every trainee that has gone through our program, they get very tired of the virtual simulator quickly, right? As soon as they, they're able to master this within about 10 to 20 hours on the virtual simulator, every exercise they do, they score about 90 and so on. Scoring at 90 becomes easier in the Da Vinci sim simulator. But when you go from 90 to 100, it takes progressively more time. So I would suggest that you spend that extra time before you start operating on a live patient your hand should be running on the simulator. There's no, there's no hesitation in your part. Movements are fluid. And then you know exactly what to do the next step so much so that it's memorized in your head. So I would suggest at least 50 hours on the virtual simulator before you go ahead and start uh, doing a bedside simulation or getting up to sit on the console. So this is the kind of uh, uh, metrics that you are uh, given when you finish a simulator. 
And uh, look at this attempt, 66th attempt, one of my trainees has gone through this and he scored about 94 on this. And they, it, it, and they um, assess you based on the economy of motion, time to complete, instrument collisions, incorrect rings, cone collision, everything is monitored. And it can give you an accurate picture of how good you are at the simulator. So I told you, getting to 90 is easy, 90 to 100 is the most typical step. But uh, the thing is to persist and, persist and get it to that particular score. Now, I'll be honest, if I sit and do these exercises now, I may not score that highly, but uh, I would suggest and uh, tell all the trainees that make sure you try and maximize your potential on the virtual simulator. Uh, the next is there are objective uh, scoring systems that are that have been validated that have come up now that is how we assess trainees now and once they're good enough they'll be uh, progressed on to the console so again this is objectivity brought into this a performance of robotic simulated skills task and they found out that virtual simulation makes the person better when they're doing a robotic procedure and again uh, uh, reiterating the same uh, so the conclusion was a significant positive association between performance on inanimate and virtual reality tasks and intraoperative robotic performance. So it definitely helps. I think it's logical when you practice and when you operate, I think it's logical that you're going to be better when you practice more, right? So um, all of us went through this. I, I personally went through a, set, a, a minimum more than 100 hours on the virtual simulator before I went on to console training. And, and it definitely helps you progress. And this is one that came from Florida, the Tube 3 module, which has been proven to show that when you do this, your vasoculitoral anastomosis becomes much better. It's called the Tube 3 module. It's again a virtual simulator and published as well. So extended benefits of simulators, suppose um, you know, we can re-engage low volume surgeons going through advanced procedure simulation. Suppose somebody is very good at nephrectomy, they can be taught prostatectomy. Suppose somebody is good at prostatectomy, uh, they can go to partial nephrectomy and so on, right? So, and bi-weekly simulation practice of one hour may be sufficient to maintain robotic surgery skills. So if you have access to a simulator, so for instance, in India, there's only currently one company that's selling the simulators and that's uh, uh, they, they, most of the time it comes with the Da Vinci machine itself. And it is a pretty expensive version of so it's your in institution-based uh, um, uh, program, you're able to buy it much easier than if you're an individual person buying this entity, right? So again, what are the simulators available? DVSS, uh, which is again the Da Vinci Surgical Simulator, DV Trainer, uh, ROS, Tube 3, Mastro, and Experience Team Trainer. And th this is how it looks, right? Da Vinci Skill Simulator, then the Mimic Trainer, the ROS Trainer, and Robotic Moderator. The cost is what's going to put you off, right? So it's $585,000, $100,000, $126,000, again, $100,000. It's difficult for you know, non-institution-based uh, persons to by this sort of an entity. Uh, but again, if your uh, hospital is able to buy the uh, Da Vinci system, they should be able to buy uh, the trainer as well. So hopefully if they're planning to, if they've got a forward thinking vision, they will buy the trainer as well. So in conclusion, virtual simulator skill drills are an integral part of robotic urology. And they're much, much less expensive when you consider the amount of times you can use it compared to animal labs or cadaver training, et cetera. Again, there are several uh, restrictions for animal labs and cadaver training in India right now, but virtual simulators don't have that particular restriction, but they can never compete with animal labs or cadaver training in terms of what you achieve or what you learn. So it is an important adjunct to modern competency-based urology and provides targeted learning to bridge the gap. And uh, I would suggest that all, surgeon, all surgeons and make their trainees go through a virtual simulator program and enough number of hours as a bedside surgeon and then slowly graduate them onto a console surgeon. Give little bit of steps uh, to them every each and every step that is uh, steps that don't compromise uh, the surgery and then slowly graduate them onto more difficult steps. So thank you, Dr. Amlingam. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, hopefully this talk has been useful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anand. It was uh, comprehensive and uh, 
I think uh, everyone can uh, very easily uh, have an idea about what exactly uh, the trading uh, method you need to go through to become a, a fairly comfortable robotic surgeon. So I'm just asking you, you were a faculty in uh, uh, Florida in a global uh, robotic training. What is the structured program? How many hours you one has to undergo the virtual simulator? How many hours in the animal? How many animals? And uh, how many uh, uh, cases he has to undergo or assist uh, in getting done? What is the uh, overall? Uh, so, uh, in terms of uh, learning experience, that uh, the Florida Dr. Patel's unit was an outlier because uh, the volumes there were enormous. So that unit per se had 13 robots and uh, they had about six uh, simulators for training and so on. And they had an animal lab in-house. So, uh, you know, because yeah, when we, yes, when we started out, we had access to those simulators and animal labs as soon as the, the actual persons would come. So you might have a piglet, a pig uh, uh, model, uh, a pig, live pig, and then um, uh, a gynecologist would come and do something and the kidney would be free for you to come and operate. So access to animal models at that stage of my career was exceptional. But if you ask me what is, what is good for uh, a trainee now, I think minimum 50 hours on the simulator and their scores should be touching. I'm talking specifically about the Da Vinci simulator. They should be above 95 on most uh, metrics that uh, the simulator can give you. And uh, when Dr. Patel's unit, I was a bedside assistant for minimum 400 to 500 cases before we... Uh, got onto the console, but that's like uh, two years work uh, in India while uh, in, in Florida it was four months work or three months work. So I would suggest that in India, uh, at least 50 cases as a bedside assistant before you graduate onto the console. And in the console, for instance, let's take prostatectomy, you'd be given the bladder dropping first and do that for about 20 cases and then slowly open the endopelvic fascia, slowly get the DVC stitch. And by the time you finish a one-year fellowship, you should be comfortable doing the vesicurethric anastomosis and most steps of the prostatectomy. So again, most units here in India that have the robot are part of private practice as well. So we need to be measured in how much we can let the assistants do and the fellows do. And at the same time, um, uh, the goal is to train the next generation as well. So this sort of structured program where they spend enough time on the virtual console, spend enough time as a bedside assistant, and if you have a dual console system, allow them to do steps. But if you have a single console, it's also acceptable, allow them to do certain steps and then slowly graduate them onto more difficult steps. Uh, do you have any experience of uh, uh, working on the raw simula simulator? I have seen uh, it in conferences and I've sat on it and uh, it's, it's a good system, uh, but most of uh, the machines that are sold in India, which are part of the Da Vinci environment right now, uh, that simulator prob probably works well with the Da Vinci system. So if you have access to that, that'll be the best. Okay, okay. Uh, almost all the programs are um, uh, there in the software in the raw system or uh, Da Vinci or only few. So most of them are. So now they've brought in a model where they upgrade the system and there's a time frame that which you can use the simulator and so on. And then you have to pay for when the simulators uh, modules get exhausted. So again, that's something they've brought in recently, I think. But in India, it's still not caught up. Right? Currently, all most of the simulators in India you can use for as long as you want. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anand. And uh, I'll you, start answering the chat bug. Uh, uh, Questions, uh, somebody has asked. Um, Kaushal Kondavar uh, uh, asking when and how to apply for lab training. Uh, you just see our uh, website. Uh, there is a slide on uh, the brochure. We connect uh, once in uh, four months, three times in a year. Maybe uh, you can uh, uh, see our uh, website urologyclinic.in and then you can uh, enroll. It's a four day program. First day endo trainer, second day animal, third day uh, uh, models in the endo trainer box and the last day you may be able to assist uh, 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 live cases. 
So that is the structured program. We have been doing it for the last 22 years. So that's about it. Any other question in the chat box? So that completes our uh, presentation and uh, answering the queries. And uh, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Sentil, Dr. Arvind Ganpule, and uh, Anant for having made it um, fairly comprehensive one. And um, uh, feel very happy that everything uh, uh, went on very smoothly. At the outset, um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Arun Chawla and the USI ISO body for interesting us on this uh, program. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, uh, Dr. Kish. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. I think Let's all the questions the, are, yeah. We are coming to the end of the Euromed session, which was very informative today. Two modules, of one was RIRS and the other one was lab and robotics. It went on very well, except for Dr. Kandal. He had uh, shown us yesterday, it was working well the day before, but somehow there was some technical glitch today. But he covered the topics comprehensively. All the topics were covered very well. I thank all the faculty who have participated in this virtual Euromed program. Uh, thank you to all of you. Over to Dr. Rajiv Sood for his concluding remarks. Thank you, Dr. Keshav, all the faculty, and uh, for all the four modules of today's. This was a wonderful uh, Euromat inaugural uh, virtual program, first uh, ever. It has been um, conducted, and uh, the results are in front of you. All the residents are benefited. This is going to be archived and available to all the residents uh, for their uh, understanding. Uh, when we are not able to do physical uh, Euromed programs, this uh, virtual program uh, will uh, go a long way. Uh, there will be no gap also in our training. There are large number of training in, in India and uh, the uniformity and, and the education, competency-based education and training. That is the main motive of ISU. You all have cooperated and a wonderful program constructed and conceptualized. And it will go on. And we invite your suggestions, suggestions from the residents, participants also, faculty also. We are planning that whenever we do the next program, there will be the pre-test and also the post-test. And after that, there will be the further improvement. So we in, uh, wait for your suggestions uh, or your uh, active participation in all the programs of Indian School of Urology, USI, and uh, wish you all the good luck. Thank you for cooperating for two consecutive days. Back to Dr. Keshav. Thank you, Professor Rajiv. Now I invite Dr. Arun Chawla for his concluding remarks and lot of thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, the moderator and the faculty of uh, all the four modules need, needs to be con congratulated uh, that, uh, for their very, very excellent uh, uh, talks which they delivered yesterday as well as today. Uh, I think um, uh, it was not only the, the residents which uh, had gained uh, from this program, but uh, there were many uh, younger faculties who would have, uh, who would have uh, uh, use this as a very uh, important learning exercise. Even sitting there, uh, I also gained, uh, uh, I think, um, uh, many points uh, from the different uh, uh, speakers. Uh, uh, it's customary to uh, thank all the viewers who logged in for both the days. Thanks to all the faculty who were part of this program. Um, thanks to Navneet and uh, Ms. Kiran for their logistic support. And uh, 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 is it uh, Dr. Keshav? Any uh, support is there from uh, Inter? Sun, Sun Pharma. Sun Pharma. Uh, yeah, thanks to Sun Pharmaceutical uh, for their uh, support for this Euromed program. And uh, that's all from us. And uh, we'll see you for another ISU USA program. Um, thank you very much. Stay safe, stay well. Bye for now. <laughs>